Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 6, Chapter 1 The Life of Ajamil The history of the life of Ajamil. And this is text sixteen. Omagina Timirandasya Kinagana Salakaya Chakshun Militamyena Tasmai Shi Gagavena Maha. So, the discussions so far between, at least the last few verses between, um, well, I offer my most respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, who has opened my darkened eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. As I was born in the darkest of ignorance. So this is the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam with commentaries by Srila Prabhupada. And um, so they've been discussing well, uh, Sugadev Goswami, the spiritual master of Maharaj Pariksit, has been um, explaining the um, deficiencies of trying to perfect one's life through mental speculation, mental activities, philosophical uh, pursuit, and the shortcomings of that. Not that it doesn't have any value at all, but it doesn't reach the ultimate goal. It falls short. It can be helpful in a, as one's making gradual Process, progress, but there's more beyond simply philosophical and mental pursuit. And also, um, by performing ritualistic ceremonies or sacrifices and um, doing good deeds, which is in the same situation, it can be very helpful. and lessens the reactions, the karmic reactions, by doing good deeds. And can even nullify the effects of having done some uh, impious acts or sinful activity. But again, it doesn't reach the ultimate goal. It's, they're like uh, still scratching the surface. They haven't gone below the uh, like um, got to the root of the problems which is the desires within the heart only devotional service can uproot completely the sinful desires because the desire itself becomes purified no more by experiencing a higher taste in devotional service to the Lord. So this is what's being discussed here, and we're at a point now where, let's see what they're discussing. It's uh, text 16. My dear king, this is Sukadev Goswami, if a sinful person engages in the service of a bona fide devotee of the Lord and thus learns how to dedicate his life, unto the lotus feet of Krishna, he can be completely purified. One cannot be purified merely by undergoing austerity, penance, brahmachari, and the other methods of atonement I previously described. 
So there it is. If one engages in the service of a bona fide devotee and learns how to dedicate his life unto the lotus feet of Krishna, he can be completely purified. So, how valuable is the association of a bona fide devotee of the Lord? Let's see the uh, commentary here by the pure devotee of the Lord. Tat Purusha refers to a preacher of Krishna consciousness, such as the spiritual master. Shulanartam Dastakur has said, Chadiya Vaishnava Seva Nistara Payechi Keva. Without serving a bona fide spiritual master, an ideal Vaishnav who can be delivered from the clutches of Maya. This idea is also expressed in many other places. Srimad Bhagavatam says, Mahat Sevam Dvarama Hur Vimukte. If one desires liberation from the clutches of Maya, one must associate with a pure devotee, Mahatma. A Mahatma is one who engages 24 hours daily in the loving service of the Lord. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mahatmanas tu mamparta daivim prakriti masrita bhajantyanya manaso natva bhuta de mavilyam. O son of Pita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They're fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, <coughs> original and inexhaustible. Thus, the symptom of a Mahatma is that he has no other engagement than service to Krishna. One must render service to a Vaishnav in order to get free from sinful reactions, revive one's original Krishna consciousness, and be trained in how to love Krishna. This is the result of Mahatma Seva. Of course, if one engages in the service of a pure devotee, the reactions of one's sinful life are vanquished automatically. Devotional service is necessary <clears throat> not to drive away an insignificant stock of sins, <clears throat> but to awaken our dormant love for Krishna. As fog is vanquished at the first glimpse of sunlight, one's sinful reactions are automatically vanquished as soon as one begins serving a pure devotee. No separate endeavor is required. So with the other two processes, the, the problem is realized that I have some bad reactions coming. And <clears throat> whether I've knowingly committed <clears throat> some violations or through some uncontrollable material impulse, I've cr created some sinful, I've performed some sinful activities, there's a reaction coming. So how do I get away from having to uh, <clears throat> suffer those reactions? So a person attempts, once they realize that this is the case, they may attempt, and it's also recommended in the scriptures, in different scriptures it's recommended, that um, to perform pious activities to offset the negative act, the reactions. And it works. Doing good deeds does nullify. Um, performing community work, if somebody does something wrong, they may be sentenced for some time and fined, <clears throat> and they may be required to do some community service. And then that's it. They committed some... Uh, offense to the laws, and they received uh, some punishment, and now they're free from that, the reactions to that particular offense, although it may still be on their record, which follows them around, but nonetheless, they don't have to pay for that transgression again. That particular transgression has been paid for. So by performing pious activities and performing sacrifices and austerities, a 
It can be nullify the reactions that are coming from certain transgressions or sinful activities against the laws of material nature, which are set up by the Lord for the smooth running of the creation. Or one may try to uh, attain knowledge, reach a platform of consciousness, spiritual awareness to become liberated from <clears throat> the material activities, not identify, and in that way not have to suffer any reactions because they don't identify with the material situation. They have some realization of their own spiritual nature, and so they don't experience the things that happen to them as suffering or enjoyment. They become somewhat liberated by it. So they may endeavor for that to get away from the reactions that are coming from the, the suffering that's coming from. On the one hand, <clears throat> the liberated person, they become liberated from both the suffering and the enjoyment. They don't identify with any of it. Kind of suspended out there somewhere. <laughs> suspended animation. And the other person, they're busy counteracting with good deeds to not have to suffer the reactions of the mistakes they've made. <coughs> and both of them work on a temporary basis. But it's not an ultimate solution. It's, again, the dog under the car on a hot day because it's shady and cool under there but he notices there's oil dripping on his head. So he thinks, how can I solve this problem? Ah, let me crawl to the back of the car. It's still shady and cool, but there'll be no oil dripping on my head. But he really hasn't solved anything, ultimately, because he's still identifying with being a dog under a car. So <clears throat> devotional service offers the actual solution, not just performing pious activities to get free from sinful reaction, but performing devotional service to develop love of God. And then automatically, because devotional service is, in one sense, pious activity. It's certainly not sinful activity. It's actually more than pious activity, but if you looked at it, would it be sinful activity or it would be on the pious activity side? But that's not why it's being performed, simply to get free from sinful reaction. Devotional service is pious activity automatically. But it's more than that. It's to develop love of God. So it's already included, and so is liberation. Liberation's all already included, too. Because Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, completely transcendental to the material energy, the material modes, material creation. And by engaging in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one's already liberated. They're not identifying with the material body. They're not identifying with the material pains and pleasures. So they're already liberated. But devotional service is more than just liberation. And devotional service is more than just pious activities. And devotional service is more than just becoming free from sinful reactions. And that is under the direction of the Vaishnav, who's already on that platform. And is teaching the Vaishnav preacher, who is teaching how to engage in devotional service and giving very explicit instructions. Right down to uh, the minutest instructions, really, how to get up in the morning and when to get up and how to wash and bathe and cleanse, not just the uh, devotional spiritual practices of chanting and taking prasadam, but how to clean the body, 
how to brush the teeth, <laughs> how to wipe the butt. <laughs> it's just, everything is included in the instructions of the, the spiritual master because the spiritual master is not just some academic teacher. He's a loving uh, spiritual master is a loving parent and sees the disciples as, his, as dependent children. He sees his disciples in different ways. Prabhupada, our spiritual master, has uh, shared sometimes, very rare occasions, how he sees his disciples. He doesn't see them as inferior. He sees them as being sent by Krishna to help him. And uh, so there's no um, holier than thou uh, control mania involved whatsoever. It's a, a loving basis, love and trust. The spiritual master loves the disciples, and the disciples love the spiritual master. And in that relationship, the disciples serve and they help the mission of the spiritual master and the spiritual master loves the disciples and helps them to progress on the path of pure devotion to Krishna. So this is a very wonderful relationship with the spiritual master. What is it in the Gita? Um, just try to approach a bona fide spiritual master Render service time to him and inquire submissively. He can impart knowledge to you because he's seen the truth. So it's not this it's mental speculative knowledge. It's devotional realization. There's different kinds of knowledge. There's gyan, which is mental understanding. And then there's vikyan, or practical realization. <coughs> So devotional service is more than just trying to get free from sinful reactions either by performing good deeds or by trying to achieve liberation from the material concept. It's on the platform of love, of course. <clears throat> and those things are already included. The word Krishna Rapita Prana refers to a devotee who dedicates his life to serving Krishna, not to being saved from the path to hellish life. A devotee is Narayana Parayana or Vasudev Parayana, which means that the path of Vasudev or the devotional path is his life and soul. Narayana Parasarva Na Kutaschana Bibyati. Such a devotee is not afraid of going anywhere. There is a path toward liberation in the higher planetary systems and a path toward the hellish planets. But an Arayanapara devotee is unafraid wherever he is sent. He simply wants to remember Krishna, wherever he may be. Such a devotee is unconcerned with hell and heaven. He's simply attached to rendering service to Krishna. When a devotee is put into hellish conditions, he accepts them as Krishna's mercy tate nu kampam sushramikshamana. He does not protest. Oh, I'm such a great devotee of Krishna. Why have I been put into this misery? Instead, he thinks, this is Krishna's mercy. Such an attitude is possible for a devotee who engages in the service of Krishna's representative. This is the secret of success. This is such a wonderful um, sharing on behalf of Prabhupada, sharing with us. <clears throat> because this is Prabhupada's, uh, he's talking about himself. As if in the third person. Such a devotee thinks like this and does like that, but he's actually talking about himself. And we have a glimpse here into Prabhupada's consciousness directly. This is opening up to us. So, 
Krishna Rapita Prana is a devotee who dedicates his life to serving Krishna, not to being saved from the path to hell. That's not his motivation. He's automatically saved from the path to hell of life. He's already saved from that. It's already included by serving Krishna. So he dedicates his life to serving Krishna and then he doesn't worry about um, sinful reactions or doesn't worry about any of that because he's fully engaged in serving Krishna. Narayana Parayana, Vasudev Parayana, means the path of Vasudev or the devotional path is his life and soul. Anyone who observes Srila Prabhupada's activities, and he was an open book, there wasn't even one minute in a day that he had something that you couldn't, no one could see him, or some something other than serving Krishna. He was totally visible, totally visible to everyone all the time. You know? <laughs> He had no quote-unquote privacy, no private life. Everything was uh, on display. And in seeing his activities and his behaviors and his relationships with others, there was no doubt that the, he was on the path of Vasudev, that he was Narayana Parayana. And that devotional life was his life and soul. He was engaged 24 hours a day in devotional life. No, nothing else. That's all Prabhupada was made of, was devotion to Krishna. And such a devotee who is engaged totally in serving Krishna, furthermore, Narayana para sarve na kutaschana bibhyati. Such a devotee, fully engaged in serving Krishna, is not afraid of going anywhere. <laughs> uh, and where did Prabhupada not go? It's all over the world, speaking to everyone and anyone about Krishna, surrender to Krishna on the path of devotional service. So there's a path toward liberation in higher systems and a path toward hellish planets. But Narayana Para is unafraid wherever he is sent. Hmm. He's beyond those, um, those influences. He's situated differently. His activities are not taking him higher or lower. His activities are fully engaged in serving the transcendence. Krishna has nothing to do with the modes of material nature, has nothing to do with heavenly planets or hellish planets. His activities are being directed by Krishna. And wherever Krishna wants him to go, that's where he goes. It's not that he's being helplessly dragged along according to the reactions of his previous activities and some sort of material desires that are stored up in his He says none of that. He's not on that platform. He's not functioning on that platform at all. He's fully engaged in transcendental devotional service. And wherever that takes him, it doesn't change. He's always there. It's like the moon behind the clouds. If you watch, it looks like the moon's moving. The moon's not going anywhere. The clouds are moving. The moon is fixed. It's, it's staying right there. It's the clouds that are moving. But when you look at it, it looks like, oh, the moon is moving. No, the moon is not moving. So the devotee is fixed in devotional service at the lotus feet of the Lord. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> the material nature, he finds himself, although he's remaining fixed at the lotus feet of Krishna, he's finding himself in different situations in the material as the material cloud is passing by 
But he's not going anywhere. He's fixed in devotional service to Krishna. It's the temporary material energy that's moving all around. So he's not concerned with that <clears throat> he's being dragged to a heavenly planet or dragged to a lower planet. He's not being dragged anywhere. He's fixed and immovable at the lotus feet of the fixed and immovable Supreme Lord. It's just the material energy moving and swirling and combining and recombining and manifesting and unmanifesting around him. <laughs> There's a path toward liberation, the higher systems, and a path toward hellish planets, but this devotee, the Narayana Para devotee, is unafraid wherever he is sent. He simply wants to remember Krishna, wherever he may be, such a devotee is unconcerned with heaven and hell, is simply attached to rendering service to Krishna. He's fixed, devotional service. When a devotee is put into hellish conditions, he accepts them as Krishna's mercy. He does not protest. Oh, I'm such a great devotee of Krishna. Why have I been put into this misery? Instead, he thinks, this is Krishna's mercy. Now, here's, here's a very important point. Prabhupada says, such an attitude is possible for a devotee who engages in the service of Krishna's representative. This is the secret of success. So Prabhupada, he is revealing his consciousness here is that whatever he is doing, he's doing not because he's such a great devotee of Krishna. That's not his consciousness, although he is. It, he is <clears throat> trying to engage in Krishna's service by serving Krishna's representative. Now, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada Maharaj, Prabhupada Maharaj, is the spiritual master for our Prabhupada, Bhakti Vedanta Swami. And we know that Bhakti Siddhanta gave some specific instructions to Prabhupada. If ever you get money, print books preach in the Western countries, especially the English-speaking countries, get this message out. It will spread through the rest of the world that way and will enliven, revive the Indian culture also when they see, oh, the rest of the world is our Krishna. What's going on here? <laughs> huh. So it's that love and that devotional link and trying to serve Bhakti Siddhanta. And Prabhupada says here is empowering him to do the miracles that he's, that he's done. So we can take a hint from that that by serving Srila Prabhupada, our Prabhupada, then that is the secret of success. So we do that to the best of our ability. And we take that instruction to heart. And then we will be successful. In developing love of God, devotional service to the Lord. Text 17. The path followed by pure devotees who are well-behaved and fully endowed with the best qualifications is certainly the most auspicious path in this material world. It's free from fear, and it's authorized by the Shastras. Yes. The path followed by pure devotees who are well-behaved 
and fully endowed with the best qualifications. It's free from fear and it's authorized by the Shastras. So this is Sukadev explaining to Maharaj Pariksit how this <clears throat> connection with devotional service, which is the highest uh, platform, way beyond simply good deeds or uh, even liberation, how this is achieved. It's to follow in the path of the pure devotees. And he says this is authorized by the Shastras. We have some commentary here by Prabhupada. One should not think that the person who takes the bhakti is one who cannot perform ritualistic ceremonies recommended in Karmakanda section of the Vedas or is not sufficiently educated to speculate on spiritual subjects. Yeah, like taking bhakti, yeah, you're just taking the easy way out because you're not able to perform these elaborate ritualistic ceremonies and you're not in brainy enough to engage in speculating on spiritual subjects so you're just some kind of like sentimental flunky and you're just it's just sentimental stuff this bhakti <laughs> no you shouldn't think like that this is not true mayavadis generally allege that bhakti path is for women and illiterates and you see how proud and puffed up because they have some they're just like someone who's beautiful, physically beautiful. Sometimes they're blinded by that. And they can't see what it really is, how it's just temporary manifestation of some good karma in the past. And they become uh, enamored of their own physical beauty. Similarly, somebody who's very, uh, has a lot of ability to speculate and use their brain, uh, kind of get intoxicated with that get carried away by their own uh, <laughs> mental speculations. Eh? Very bewildering how the material energy works. These pride, this kind of pride and false ego of who I am. I'm this beautiful body. I'm this great brain, so much smarter than everyone else. Look at the gymnastics I can do with my brain. <laughs> so captured by the false ego. So, these puffed up Mayavadis allege bhakti is a path for women and illiterates. This is a groundless ac accusation. The bhakti path is followed by the most learned scholars, the Goswamis, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Ramanujacharya. These are the actual followers of the bhakti path. Regardless of whether or not one is educated or aristocratic, one must follow in their footsteps. Mahajano yena gata sapanta. One must follow the path of the Mahajans. The Mahajans are those who have taken to the path of devotional service. For these great personalities are the perfect persons. As stated in the Bhagavatam, yas yasti bhaktira, Bhagavatya Kinchana Sarvargunas Tatra Samasate Sara. One who has unflinching devotion to the personality of Godhead has all the good qualities of the demigods. The less intelligent, however, misunderstand the bhakti path and therefore allege that it is for one who cannot execute religious ceremonies or speculate. As confirmed here by the word Sadrachina Bhakti is the path that is appropriate, not the paths of karmakanda or jnanakanda. Mayavadis may be sushila sadhava, well-behaved saintly persons, but there is nevertheless some doubt about whether they are actually making progress, for they have not accepted the path of bhakti. On the other hand, those who follow the path of the acharyas, or sushila and sadhava, but furthermore, their path is akutubaya, which means free from fear. 
one should fearlessly follow the twelve Mahajans and their line of disciplic succession and thus be liberated from the clutches of Maya. So, yes, there are some really puffed up Mayavadis, but then there are also very humble, well-behaved, saintly persons who are on the liberated platform. They are liberated and they're well-behaved, they're non-violent, and they want to do good to others. But here Prabhupada says there's doubt about whether they're actually making progress, for they've not accepted the path of bhakti. And it is every possibility of becoming entangled once again in action and reaction, where a liberated person wants to do something. They don't want to just sit there liberated and nothing to do. It's the nature of the living entity to be active. Spiritual energy has to be active. And so they come back down to the material platform to do these good works. But then what happens if you do good works? Then you have to get the reaction for doing good works, which means there's some karma there again. You can't maintain the spiritual platform, the uh, liberated platform, become again somehow entangled in the material energy. Even if it's just the mode of goodness, it still has karmic reactions. The platform of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the only platform that has no karmic reactions. So what are these karmic reactions? It's when the seeds of desire to enjoy begin to sprout within the heart. So for a liberated person coming in contact with the material energy, even simply wanting to help people, there's every possibility that the desire to somehow or other enjoy materially will again begin to sprout within the heart simply by contacting the material energy without the protection of being a representative of the Lord. Without serving the Lord, the Lord's devotees. Without being like deputized by the Lord. That, that has immunity. There's immunity there. You're deputized by the Lord to perform all sorts of activities. We were just, Prabhupada was just sharing with us that such a devotee, Narayana Parayana, who's firmly fixed in devotional service at the lotus feet of the Lord, by taking shelter of the Lord's representative and trying to serve his mission, to, trying to serve him, such a person is immunized. They can go anywhere. Heavenly, hellish, it doesn't matter. It's just, they're on assignment. <laughs> and he sees Krishna's mercy. But someone who's coming from the, simply the liberated platform, not really being deputized, or, but they have a mission to try to help other people, maybe bring them to a liberated platform or whatever, or to ease the sufferings of the material world. They don't have that protection. They're very vulnerable by being in contact with the material energy, heavenly or hellish. That the desire to enjoy materially may begin to sprout again within the heart. And there they are, back again, pious and impious. And the so-called liberation fades. So such a person may endeavor again for liberation and then again fall down. So this kind of thing can go on for quite a while, too. Time to stop it. Text 18. My dear king, as a pot containing liquor cannot be purified even if washed in the waters of many rivers, 
Non-devotees cannot be purified by processes of atonement, even if they perform them very well. So here's another example. One example was the weed growing. It would cut off the top, cut off the tops of all these weeds. The root still remains. So this is another example, a pot that has contained liquor, even if it's washed in many rivers, cannot be purified. And similarly, processes of atonement, although washing the sinful reactions away, doesn't get to the root, even if they perform them perfectly. In other words, if you wash a, liquor, a pot that contained liquor in many rivers, I mean, you'd really give it like a first-class washing job. It can't be purified that way. Also, the process of atonement, even if it's performed exceptionally well, it still can't completely purify someone who's not engaged in devotional service. Prabhupada's commentary, to take advantage of the methods of atonement, one must be at least somewhat devoted Otherwise, there's no chance of one's being purified. Ah, so if you add a little devotion to it, then there's a chance. So if there's, it has to be at least some idea of devotion there, devotion to the Lord, to when undergoing these processes of atonement. It's that element of devotion that will make the atonement successful ultimately successful. So there has to be at least some, uh, some, somewhat, something devoted there. Otherwise, there's no chance. He's performing these activities that really won't get purified. It's clear from this verse that even those who take advantage of karma khanda and jnana khanda by not at least slightly devoted cannot be purified simply by following these other paths. Yeah, it's not some mechanical process. Um, to perform these things mechanically or uh, religiously. <laughs> you see, that's the problem. Just to perform something religiously, if there's no devotion, but rigidly performing these things, or even perfectly, according to how they're written and described to be performed, in the karma kanda section. If there's no devotion, well, if, if Krishna says, if one offers me with love and devotion a fruit, a flower, a leaf, or water, I'll accept it. He doesn't say, if one offers me with a leaf, flower, fruit, or water, I'll accept it. He says, with devotion. So, for someone who has no devotion, where does that devotion come from? It comes from acting under the direction of the advanced devotee who does have devotion. So the spiritual master who has devotion, if the aspiring devotee, who really doesn't have any devotion, offers the fruit, flower, leaf, or water under the direction of the spiritual master who does have devotion, then it will be accepted. That's how it works. So if I'm reading these writings of His Divine Grace, Isibhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and I don't have any devotion, <laughs> I don't have any devotion, but if I'm reading them under His direction, He has devotion, then Krishna is accepting the service because Prabhupada has the devotion. I don't have the devotion. I'm doing this because Prabhupada has the devotion and he's instructed you should read these books. So, Hare Krishna. <laughs> the devotion is in the instruction and in the books. I mean, you can't get much more basic than that. The spiritual master is in his books and in his instruction. If his instruction is to read the books, then 
the path of devotional service opens up. The path back to Godhead opens up. And why do we read the book? So that we can hear from the pure devotee. And from those who are trying to serve the pure devotee. <laughs> Devotional service expands like that. Unlimitedly. After all, this Bhagavatam is 5,000, is actually, it's older than that. It was just recorded 5,000 years ago. So this has been going on for quite some time path of devotional service, hearing from the realized souls and repeating without changing. In that way, engaging in devotional service, opening the path of bhakti. It's called disciplic succession. There you go, sir. So, yeah, the pot that, that had liquor in it can't be cleaned. So, yeah. It's clear from the verse that even those who take advantage of karmakanda and jnanakanda, but are not at least slightly devoted, cannot be purified simply by following the other path. So without bhakti, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. The, um, the account of Bhakti Siddhanta when he was sitting in darshan with his disciples, and they could, some of the, they could hear the conch shell and the curtain opening for the deity artik in another part of the building. And some of the disciples excused themselves to go see the deity. And Bhakti Siddhanta commented to those who remained in the room, what they will see, simply eye exercise. And I always wondered about that. It makes sense intuitively to me that if the living representative of the Lord is sitting there before you, where else is there to go? He's the lifeline, he's the link, he's the devotional, he's the embodiment of the devotion and devotion is how you go to Krishna. And to get up and walk out and go see the deities at that point was, so it made sense that he would say that. But in the light of this verse, it makes even more sense. So this, this is the, the fun and the excitement of reading and rereading and hearing these messages over and over again because new lights come out and go deeper and deeper into the devotional moods and mellows. And it's so sweet. It's what we want. We want to taste, taste something. We have to or we can't stay. We have to begin to taste something or we're pulled away into material tastes. So that when Bhakti Siddhanta said like that, simply I exercise, in looking at this verse, those that perform these karmakanda and jnanakanda activities without devotion, it's useless, it's just some mechanical performance. Similarly, and Bhakti Siddhanta, he's the embodiment of devotional service. So to leave him to go do something, even to see the deities, he's saying it's just a mechanical exercise. It's just an eye exercise. Oh, Bhakti Siddhanta. Krishna. Huh. 
Mm. Yes, we want to taste something. <laughs> we want to taste love of God. The function of the tongue is to take Krishna prasadam and to vibrate messages of Godhead. Vibrate Hare Krishna. So this is how we taste. <clears throat> So, simply I exercise without devotion. And here we are with the dirty pot here that can't be cleaned simply by Gyana Kanda and Kamakanda. The word prayaschitan, e, is plural in number to indicate both Karmakanda and Gyana Kanda. Nartam Das Thakur therefore says, Karma Kanda, Jnana Kanda, Kevala Vishera Vanda. Nartam Das Thakur compares the paths of Karma Kanda and Jnana Kanda to pots of poison. Mm. Liquor and poison are in the same category. According to this verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, a person who has heard a good deal about the path of devotional service but is not attached to it, who's not Krishna conscious, is like a pot of liquor. Such a person cannot be purified without at least a slight touch of devotional service. Mm. Yes, devotional service is the, the magic that transforms everything. Transforms everything from material and spiritualizes everything. That's why renunciation Rupa Goswami explains that re real renunciation isn't, no, no, I don't do this. No, no, I don't do that. You want to give me money? No, no, I renounce money. You want to give me a car? No, no, I don't want a car. You want to give me a temp uh, land? No, no, I don't want land. I'm renounced. That's not real renunciation. Real renunciation, oh, you want to give me money? Yes, thank you. We'll use it spread Krishna consciousness. Oh, you want to give a camera, a car, all these things? Very nice. We'll use them. That's real renunciation. So the engagement in devotional service of the Lord, when something is engaged, what to speak of someone, everything becomes spiritualized when it's engaged in the service of the Lord. But the things in themselves, without being engaged in the service of the Lord, they're dangerous. The money is very dangerous. Not served, not used in the service of the Lord to maintain the temple, to spread the preaching, to maintain the devotees. It's very dangerous. Simply squandered on sense gratification, entertainment, useless waste of time. But even the slightest touch of devotional service purifies. So. These are good verses, boy. Okay, the next one is a little long, so we'll save it. And. Whew. Hare Krishna. <laughs>